you are all incredibly welcome here today. I see we've lots of staff and volunteers in the room, a number of our funders and a number of our partners, NGO partners and others. So you are all very welcome, as well as those that are joining us online today. Um, we have a very interesting more afternoon ahead of us. Uh, we're going to start off by hearing from David Carroll, our CEO. He'll be our first speaker today. Um, and that'll be followed by Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan, who's in the room with us today. She'll be speaking and she'll take some questions at the end of her session. Then Sarah Reeves, our Director of People and Organization, will be speaking. Um, and lastly, will be Liz Lydia Stanson um, speaking to us before we have a video from Minister O'Brien. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a small wrap up Q&A panel discussion and we'll all go and have some refreshments that are here today. So again, these are all very welcome. Sit back and hopefully you just get to hear some very interesting uh, information today. And I'm going to pass it over to our CEO, David Carroll, as our first speaker. Thanks, Dermot. Um, and you're all really very, very welcome today. You notice the... Um, the title, Leading the Way Home. And I think the whole tone and tenor today has been about the role that you as staff and volunteers and service users have taken in the last couple of years and in 2022 to do the most complex work with the most complex set of problems, both for people within our society who are on the margins and we've led the way, and we plan to continue to lead the way in ending homelessness on this island, both north and south. So there's no coincidence around that title and that sense of trajectory and direction, which at times can feel so frustrating uh, for you um, in trying to work with the huge difficult issues that our work presents for us but we have resilience and strength as an organization and courage, and that will continue um, into the next year, having reflected on today about our impact report. And I'd like to welcome colleagues, trustees, service users, volunteers, funders, and friends. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you today, and thank you for joining us for the launch of our 22 impact report. It comes at a critical juncture during the homelessness and housing crisis, where DePaul is seeking to make a meaningful impact and to lead the way home for each of our service users. And in 2022, DePaul supported over 7,400 men, women and children amidst the escalating homelessness crisis, a twofold uh, increase compared to last year highlighting the importance of tackling homelessness in a radical way. Working with vulnerable and complex individuals means taking action and taking risks to transform lives. In the face of the ever-growing humanitarian crisis across this island, our staff and volunteers responded with a passion to deliver quality services whilst helping people to give people uh, a path home. And I would like to pay a uh, tribute to your tremendous work carried over uh, the last seven months. And we've much to be proud of. Chiefly, our ability to reach and engage those who are most marginalized and our ability to be flexible and innovative in responding to the needs that our society presents and continue our unique approach to low threshold working across this whole island. Our philosophy and values leaves nobody behind. And this conviction provides leadership at a time when strength and courage is needed on this island. Last year, despite additional challenges, our staff still managed to help 500, 499 service users move out of homelessness and into suitable long-term accommodation. The Paul's Housing Association has been making every effort to acquire properties to help individuals and families desperate to exit temporary accommodation. Um, and we saw DePaul Housing getting off the ground that this year from its operational establishment in 2020 when we've, we created 47 ten tenancies. 
And this is really progress in a very short time, underpinning an approach that everybody has a right to a home. Every day, our staff are making life-saving and life-changing interventions, and we couldn't be more proud of you. You may not be aware of this, but over the last couple of weeks, our team in Filehaven and Derry responded to three overdoses on the streets of Derry. Thankfully, through their quick responses, three more lives were saved. And 202 lives were saved in the last year by DePaul staff through the administration of naloxone, the life-saving drugs. And it highlights the increasing prevalence of drug use amongst our people who are entering into homelessness and a need for a more radical rethink of drug and alcohol policy on the island, north and south, to refocus on the health needs of those amongst whom we serve. This year marks 10 years of the Paul's Housing First Model in Northern Ireland, one of the most successful housing initiatives to date in eradicating homelessness. And you notice that beeping is ha happening, but I've got a loud voice, so I'll continue. <laughs> in 10 years, this groundbreaking initiative supports 383 extremely vulnerable individuals to move into their own home and to sustain their tenancies, which is not an easy feat when they're experiencing multiple and complex personal challenges. And we have real ambitions that will play a key part in Housing First going forward in the Republic of Ireland as well. We look forward to working with the Housing Executive to continue our work on a regional rollout uh, in Northern Ireland. And issues around accommodating refugees dominated much of the national agenda in 22 and into 23. It was a year like no other. But the Paul support 2,664 people through their Kusan Nua service, helping 224 people exit direct provision. This work could never be and is, it can't be more critical at this time. With the outbreak of war in Ukraine, DePaul provided help via DePaul's Support and Resettlement Fund for displaced people as Ukrainian refugees began to uh, arrive in Ireland. And our response to essential inreach, linking with our newly arrived Ukrainian uh, uh, people also supported, uh, we also supported our colleagues in DePaul, Ukraine by, by raising badly needed funds. We must continue to acknowledge that addressing homelessness requires more than temporary solutions. And I know the state can do more to reach out to those most in need. And as an organization, we're advocating for more funding in the cu current budget, coming budget. Um, hostels are not the future. Communities where people can thrive are, and that underpins our housing-led approach. 22 also saw the full absorption of those services taken over from the SVP in Cork, Waterford, Wexford, Carlow and Longford, a monumental project which has been pioneering in the NGO sector and has made DePaul truly a national and cross-border organisation. I'd like to thank our Board of Trustees who come from a wide range of backgrounds for their time, skills and professionalism. And under their leadership, DePaul continues to extend and reach the highest standards, governance and financial standards. And that is so important uh, in the current environment. Our executive and senior, senior leadership team, I want to thank you for your professional dedication. And I'd like to thank a range of funders from the state, uh, our local authorities and the HSC, and other grant-making bodies, and our increased relationship with business and the public for continued support of our organization. It's helped us negotiate another challenging year where the cost of living crisis began to have a major impact on us as an organization, but more importantly, on the lives of people who we serve. You, our staff and volunteers, have played a crucial role in transforming the lives of thousands of people. Congratulations on all your achievements and hard work and your commitment and leadership as we work towards our mission to end homelessness. It is imperative that the government listens to the sector's call for fairness and equity in the treatment of our workforce. Funding must be provided to reward and recognise our staff 
in line with the public sector. The time has come to address this issue structurally, particularly in the forthcoming budget. We're internally grateful to everyone who gives their time, money and talents to help us achieve our objectives and provide services for the thousands of men, women and children who we serve. Cross-government leadership will be critical in the next couple of months and years to us emerging from this crisis and to minimise the impact on our social fabric and cohesion. And DePaul will play a leadership role in working with those who are most marginalised and left behind to ensure they're not left behind in the coming years as our housing comes on stream. This is our focus. So this report is intended to form inform a wide audience, including policymakers, staff, funders, our partners and friends within the sector interested in DePaul's progress. And in this spirit, we've uh, uh, invited a distinguished panel of thinkers who will help us dive deeper into thinking about how, how DePaul can lead the way uh, in the coming months and years in relation to our workforce. <clears throat> I can't thank you, all of you people in this room, for the strength and resilience and courage um, and risk taking that you've taken, both as service users, volunteers and staff, over the last year and year and a half. And I'm so proud to be part of the poll. Bear with me. Um, well done, David. Um, and we'd really like to echo what David's talked about today. Thank you to everybody. I think um, we can't achieve what we do without each other, uh, whether it's the leadership of our trustees, our executive teams, or, or our staff to support our service users and their leadership and working with us to come up with solutions to end homelessness. So I think um, it's a really profound report and, and do read it if you get the opportunity. Our next speaker who's up on our, our board is Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan. And Katrina's story is incredibly remarkable. Um, from gone from being a young single mother who was cleaning toilets in Conley Station to being awarded her PhD, she's had multiple grants and awards bestowed upon her and she's got a pretty good book out as well at the moment so uh, we're hoping she'll win some awards soon. Uh, Katrina grew up in England in poverty and our, our parents were heroin addicts and she's very eager to ensure that um, people, young people get the opportunities that she's had and no young person has to face uh, what she's had to face and get the opportunities to celebrate their potential very much in line with the Paul's values. So without further ado we're going to bring Katrina up. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's uh, an, an honor to be here. Um, it's so random the way I was asked to speak today. So um, I am trying to raise money for DePaul. I'm running 10K. I'm not running a marathon. I said a marathon at the beginning, but I gave that ticket to my husband because he's faster than me and fitter. But um, yeah, and so Noreen rang me and asked if I'd come and talk. And I never ever say no to, well, if I can, to giving service and giving thanks and trying to spread the message around how important it is to provide services and supports for women particularly, because that's where my passion lies, but for everybody who's lived through poverty. Um, when I think about homelessness, sometimes I think that's the end. That's the end of someone's journey. And the journey before that has been generally pretty horrific. So I'm gonna just talk to you about my journey to my homelessness and then this, how the system rose up to meet me, this poor girl who was terribly messed up. I swear a lot, so if I swear, please don't judge me. <laughs> I should be allowed to swear, that's my background. It's. Uh, <laughs> So I express myself. So anyway, I grew up to an Irish family in the heart of England. My dad actually already had a heroin problem, I think, before he arrived in England. He grew up in Clontarf. Leafy Clontarf is what they call it. But uh, he um, was adopted. He went through Golden Bridge and he experienced the abuse that happens that happened in some of our institutions. And my mom was also poor because like poverty reproduces itself. We are 
born into our families and oftentimes very difficult to escape whatever they're born into. And so they grew up in this house where there was music and there was love and there was weed and then there was heroin. And unfortunately, when your parents are heroin addicts, you are hungry, um, not just for food, you're hungry for stimulation, for love, for validation. And my experience was that I went to school, most of us who come from a family like mine go to school and we're not literally the kids that can sit there for six hours and go, please miss, teach me some more. Like I was the kid that was throwing shit at the teachers. I was the one that smelled a piss and had nits. And what happens to you when you have a family like that at home and then you go to school is that you're on your own in school and you're on your own at home and nobody wants to play with you. And occasionally I had these amazing teachers. They really invested so much in me. So my first teacher was this Irish teacher, Miss Arkinson. I remember my first day in England, they all called me Catriona, which was really annoying because it's Katrina, obviously, but she knew my name and she was like, oh, another Irish girl. And uh, she invested just, she just cared about me, this lovely little Irish woman. She taught me how to wash myself. So a month or two into school, obviously I was going into school smelling a wee and she took me into the bathroom and she had these little knickers, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday written on them and a big white towel and a flannel. And she taught me how to wash myself. And she didn't shame me, even though I felt ashamed, she didn't make me feel ashamed. She tried to empower me and give me the tools to look after myself. And I suppose that's one of the things I think is really important about when we work with people who are in homelessness or in poverty or struggling. It's how we meet them. It's really essential that we think about the person as a whole rather than someone that's broken that needs fixing. So I grew up in this household that was crazy, but was full of love. Like addicts are not horrible people. It really pisses me off when like people just remember or talk about my dad as if he was a needle in his groin. That wasn't all of him. He taught me how to read. He taught me how to fight. <laughs> and I'm fucking good at that. <laughs> he taught me how to advocate for myself. He taught me how to speak my mind. There's loads of skills within poor communities that I think we just overlook and we forget are there because we see broken people. And, um, but unfortunately, addiction robbed us of a lot of stuff. It robbed me of self-esteem and it robbed me really of my education, not just their addiction, but when you're born into addiction, it's pretty attractive. When you've all this broken shit inside of you, it's very, very attractive to just wanna escape from that. And as a teenager, even though I was beautiful and had so much potential, like all the people that you work with, the drive to escape was much stronger so the drive to be good, because I wanted to be good, like loads of kids want to be good. And I loved boys, <laughs> especially the bad ones. And at 15, I followed my destiny. And it was my destiny, because it was said to me by everybody, not just my family, but no one in school expected me to go to university. Nobody thought, like, finishing was the highest bar for me, as it is now in Desh schools. The metric is, did we get them through to the end? Not did they go to Trinity College or UCD or Oxford or Cambridge. And at 15, I got pregnant and I left school and I was kicked out of my home and I was homeless. I was, ho I was homeless in Birmingham. And honestly, being homeless was the darkest period of my life. Not just because I didn't have a bed to go to, but there was nobody for me to go to. Sometimes when I used to be alone in my family home, despite the craziness, just the fact that someone was in the room next door made me feel less alone. I could imagine that I was loved. I could imagine that somebody somewhere cared about me. And I was taken, I was, I was in a flat, in a hostel. I was in a flat squatting and it was a shithole. And there was drugs being used and everything there. And the council came and the social services. And I remember this woman saying to me, we've got a place for you in a homeless hostel. And I was so bulgy and like, you know, cocky by that point. I'm pretty cocky now, but I was worse then. I was angry and her. And uh, she said, we've got a place for you in a homeless hostel. So teenage, for teenage mothers, uh, we're gonna, you, you have to go. And I'm like, I'm not going. I'm staying here. And I'm inside, and I write about this in my book. Inside, I was like, please make me go. Please, someone help me. But it's very hard to ask for help, especially when you've seen so much destruction. And actually, 
Most of the women I dealt with in them situations previously, the women who wear floral dresses and modest shoes, they, they weren't very nice to me. The teachers weren't very nice to me. The social workers weren't very nice to me. My family told me not to trust them. So at this particular uh, juncture, I was afraid, but I knew I needed help. And they took me to this lovely mother and baby hostel in Birmingham. And I say it was lovely because the staff there were phenomenal. I didn't know how to change a nappy. I didn't know how to make a bottle. And there was another lovely Irish woman, ironically, who worked downstairs. She was a midwife. I didn't know that, but we had to like pass the test as we had to pass the test before we were allowed to get our own council flat. My only goal in life at that point was to get a council flat of my own. That was it. Council flat and social welfare payment, them two things, maybe a little cash and hand job and a decent fella. I, think I got a couple of them things, but I'll tell you about that another time. You read my book, actually. <laughs> but in the hostel, it was like really changed my life in many ways. The support that I got in there was phenomenal. And not everybody experiences it that way. But for me, I did. Having a warm bed, having some food, having someone to talk to if I needed to. That was really, really amazing. But the loneliness and isolation never left me. I think it was the darkest period of my life. I was in that hostel for nearly 18 months and nobody came and visited. I didn't have anyone to go and stay with. Some of the girls in there would go home. I didn't have a home to go home to, so that was quite hard. But I got my council flat, you know, and girls like me, women like me, I got my council flat and I had my baby, but something you mentioned there, like the wraparound, like housing doesn't fix everything. It's a part of the bigger problem. Many people who come from poor backgrounds or have been through poverty or been through trauma or have mental health difficulties, we need so much more than a house, but a house is the first thing. You need a home, we need a bed, you need a space to be safe. Safety was the biggest thing for me. A home and my payments, full stop. And then whatever comes next, comes next. And so, but for me, the other stuff, that I had inside of me, the angst, the isms, whatever you want to call it, they drove me in lots of directions that I, I never regret because I'm proud of my life. But like I needed support in lots of ways. So I ended up taking drugs, being crazy, I got my flat, but I was still, I still needed fixing. I still needed support. I still needed so much more. And I was very lucky that I moved to Dublin in early 2000s. We were in the Celtic Tiger in Dublin at the time. I got myself a little rented flat. Actually, Dermot was in my flat at one point or another. I used to be fagging it, chatting all night. Um, but, you know, I got myself a little flat in Summerhill. I got myself a lone parents book. Got myself a little cash in hand job in Connolly Station, cleaning shitty toilets. It wasn't my dream, but I didn't really have that many dreams. And um, I found myself lucky that when I was in, the, in Dublin at that time, it was the boom. And in that boom, we were investing. We invested in poverty. So poor people mattered then. Maybe we could save a few women. Maybe we could make them more like us. So they invested in supports and systems. I'm not at all cynical, as you can tell. But there was loads of things going on in the community that I was able to avail of. Firstly, most importantly, there was community workers. So in, in Summerhill, down in the Five Lamps, there was a great guy, Joe Dowling. Some of you might know him, others won't. But you used to be able to pop into Joe and have a fag and a cup of tea and talk shit for hours. And that mattered. It might not seem important to you, but being able to go to a place where you trust and there's people that you know are sound and they're not going to judge and tell the social welfare or any of your business, that was really important. And I remember going into Joe and saying, Joe, I just can't find a man. And Joe was like, that's because you, you need to stop going with them men first. And then what you need to do is get counseling. Second most important thing, within a day, he'd rang Sheriff Street, Oasis Counseling, and I was in front of a counselor within a week. And it was free, and it was funded. I didn't have to worry about losing anything. Next thing, back to Joe. Joe, Joe. And he was like, sick of me probably. But I was like, what is this? He said, you need to do some courses or something. So next thing, down to Larkin Centre, and there was a little course for parenting, and it went around the kids. John was fine, my son, he was in school, everything was grand. So I could go and drop him off into William Street School and then pop into the Larkin, and I did a couple hours a day, and I learned about the food pyramids. I thought chicken nuggets were healthy. 
you need to give them more broccoli. That's what I learned. But I learned also about like, my mind started to open. And I was in recovery at this point. I didn't drink, I didn't drug. I was trying my best to be this person, this better person. And then one of the most pivotal things happened to me is I met a girl on O'Connell Street outside Penny's on a Thursday morning after getting my lone parents book. And she said to me, I'm in Trinity College. And she was a townie, like, she was like one of me, one of us. And I was like, no fucking way. And she said, oh yeah, I swear to God, there's this program, Trinity Access Program, blah, 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 blah. I swear, one of the things you need to know about poor people, people in homelessness, we're strong, resilience, we can advocate, we've skills. All I need is the environment to flourish. And I was so lucky that one of my big skills is being able to fight for myself. I marched over to Trinity College, the balls on me, knocked on the door of the Trinity Access Program and said to this little posh woman, I don't know if she's posh, I think she was posh, she looked posh. <laughs> I'm Katrina, my friend is Karen, she got this course, I think I want to change my life, I love reading books. She's like, whoa. And she said to me, you're amazing. I told her my whole story, didn't keep any of it in. And she said, you're absolutely amazing. And that changed my life. Karen, Joe, childcare supports. That was the next thing. So meeting a woman who did it before me, having housing, having rent allowance. And then when I went to Trinity, the most important thing was I didn't lose my book. I, did, I got a grant, I got community childcare. I got all these wraparound supports to be able to empower me to participate fully in education. And what I learned in education was that I'm absolutely amazing. And I don't mean that, for, I know it's funny, it is funny, but my life prior to that experience had taught me that I was a stupid girl, that I'd fucked up my own life. I made myself homeless, I took drugs, I broke, the, I broke myself, I didn't look after my child. And when I went to Trinity College and I started getting firsts, which is an A by the way, I was like, I'm actually something other than what I thought I was. And that, you can't pay for that. And not everybody's journey is Trinity College. Not everybody's journey is education. Someone might get it in hairdressing. Someone might get it in community work, maybe in DePaul. But for me, I learned that I was something. And then I learned that the system is broken. And the system is really rigged against people like me. And that there's all these people who, who get the privilege of going to places like Trinity College who know it and do nothing about it. And I decided that I didn't want to be one of them people. I got a PhD from Trinity College, which means I'm a doctor and I'm amazing. But I also got an insight into the system and how bad it is for people like us and how it teaches us that we're broken and that it's our fault. And it's not our fault. We need more support, we need funding, we need housing, we need childcare. When a woman asks for help, the system needs to rise up and meet her immediately. If it's treatment, she needs to have it now. If it's childcare, she needs to have it now. If it's education, and I say she, because if you empower a woman, you change the future of her life and her whole family. I'll finish on this. My middle son, so my first son came the journey for me. He's, a, he's amazing. He's a football player, he's brilliant. But my first son got his offer of university last week. He's the first one in our family to finish education fully, and he's the first one to go without needing, well, he's needed me, but he hasn't needed the whole system to rise. Because when you empower people like me, you transform the potential of their whole fucking families. Sorry for swearing. If you're in here and you're a volunteer, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you, for meeting a girl like me and making it fairer. And if you're a funder, give more fucking money. <laughs> Nothing is ever enough, and you're a policy maker. You, you know right to look away from this issue. Anyway, I'll finish on that. Thank you. Talk into the mic, yeah. That's okay. I'll just stand next to you. Just don't be weird about it. <laughs> um, before we go on to the next piece, we have a few minutes for Q&A. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask Katrina? Paula. First of all, can I say congratulations? Thank you. 
congratulations. Thank you. I think you're amazing, so congratulations on that. And just to give you anything, um, you've, you've touched on it and what you've said, but on the challenges of growing up in poverty and being impacted by homelessness, and how that impacts on your opportunities for education or life opportunities and, and how that can be addressed. I think, um, like systemic change needs to happen but like from an individual point of view i have so i talked about miss arkinson if you imagine that you're a child growing up in poverty and that can look different for lots of people but say there's emotional and financial poverty within your life as a child i think every adult that you meet has an opportunity to provide you with a light inside yourself and provide you with some hope and some some something to work from so like from an individual point of view, I think if you're working with people that you, everybody needs to remember you potentially can change that person's life and that child's life. I think systemically, we, we, we need to end homelessness, first of all. The instability that that causes for, for parents and then children is just phenomenal. But the reality is, I think from an individual point, so that includes more funding, more care, more education opportunities. Like for me, I'm so passionate about education because it transforms the way I see the world, not just my potential from an income point of view and a, and a home point of view, but I see the world differently. And what angered me most was that I wasn't allowed to access this, this way of thinking and this, this skill. But I think with children, like what changed my life, I, f I really believe, is that when I went to school, the teachers that really cared, they provided me with a... A, a, a soundboard to work from that wasn't coming to me from my home because there was so much instability. So I think as adults, if you're working with children who experience poverty or trauma, then it's to remember that your impact, even if you might not see it, will be long lasting. Those little things. Yeah, small things, care. Yeah. Jim. Poor, <laughs> poor, P-O-O-R. And it's because the system's poor, not me. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, if anybody. Ryan. I just asked, you mentioned like a whole range of different kinds of supports that you need to kind of get where you are today, but if there was one thing <sighs> that you think should be in place now to kind of help with the homeless I think it's security. So like uh, the way I grew up, like if you imagine, I couldn't think beyond the next day and the secure, security was the most important thing. So having secure uh, finances and a home were fundamental because that's, that's, I couldn't have done, so when I got off of Trinity and I was in my little flat in North Great Charles Street and my neighbor who was also a lone parent, the first question she asked me was, will you lose your rent allowance? Will you, but like that is a real, real fear. So like, I think for anybody, the starting point has to be to have the, the, the basic needs met of ho home, house and finances before you can transform. Because if I'd have lost them, I wouldn't have stayed. And the truth is, I talked about the 2000s, we've got 80, 81 billion surplus now in the government and we are not investing the same way we did in, in 2000. So like the reality is we have the money to do it. We can transform the system, but we're not doing it the same way we did. And it's really unfortunate because if I went to Trinity today, I wouldn't get in. And I wouldn't get the funding that I needed to, to thrive. Guys, last chance. Going, going, going. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Katrina, your story is inspiring um, and you clearly know it yourself, which is even more empowering. Um, I think like, I, I'm, I'm definitely touched listening to you today. I think it very much speaks to our values in Nepal to celebrate the potential of people, you know, to put words into action, take wider roles in civil society, you know, and rights and responsibilities. You know, you, you knew your rights but you also have the responsibility to go and knock on that door in tap and ask them, let me in. So um, uh, very empowering. Thank you for that today. It's been, it's been really lovely. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Sarah Reeves. Uh, she's our Director of People and Organization. And Sarah will be speaking to us on leadership and our workforce and emerging from a homeless crisis. She's going to look at how 
DePaul as an organization can empower its staff to deliver on this and to help end homelessness. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Sarah. Thanks, Dermot. Um, so I'm with DePaul about five years and I lead the people in an organization team in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. My team support HR, volunteering and quality and compliance. So I'm part of influencing the direction and strategy of DePaul and place a strong emphasis on leading the way through our greatest asset, our people. And it's great to see so, mon so many of you here today as well. Um, I normally work behind the scenes so it's a privilege to be able to speak today. Um, it's, it's not something I, I do on a, a normal basis. So um, yeah, I'm um, delighted to be able to do so. Um, so 2022, when we think about that and we think about now um, in terms of leading the workforce, it really has been an era of change. We started to return to normal after a pandemic. We also are experiencing um, a cost of living crisis. Um, we're continuing to the work on the integration of the seven regional services. And we've also had to expand our services to meet the substantial need that exists out there. Um, there's a deepening housing crisis. There's more refugees entering the country. So more people than ever are accessing emergency accommodations. And when I think about staff as well, who do support people who are experiencing homelessness, they themselves are also, I suppose, at the mercy of cost of living crisis, of a deepening housing crisis. And they themselves have, you know, had to look for accommodation. It's hard to find accommodation. It's, you know, it's difficult to buy. It's difficult to rent. They also face evictions. Um, and, you know, that in itself is, is worrying in terms of, I suppose, our sustainability with, with, within um, supporting those that need it most. So just like the picture and also um, inspired by Katrina as well, um, I, I wanted to talk about running a marathon. So this requires a lot of dedication and training and there's a lot of mental energy needed, a lot of focus to get to the finish line. So we do need the support and proper investment from our strategy funders to keep going. They need to be in all in, all in as well. Um, if we are to change the lives of people affected by homelessness. So we're experiencing a huge recruitment and retention challenge. We need to be able to offer more competitive salaries. The cuts and stagnation in funding has um, really not helped over the last number of years and we are being left behind by our counterparts in the public sector. So there's a pay gap now of 15% um, and we are supporting more people than ever with less staff than the previous year. So you'll see our numbers increased in terms of the amount of support we're giving, but our staff number actually decreased as well. So there's a huge stretch on, um, I suppose, people that are supporting the most vulnerable um, and the most marginalized. So really what I'm saying is more investment is needed in the sector to support the important work that we do in DePaul. Okay, so our vision, mission and values. Um, in DePaul, we lead through our vision, mission and values. It really is our North Star. So it's a constant, it's there to guide us, it's there to inspire us, it's there to influence us, and we depend on it when the world around us keeps changing. So on my first day in DePaul, um, I actually visited Sundial House. Um, it's one of our alcohol managed services. And um, the staff explained to me um, all about servant leadership and what that meant for them and how they took their lead from service users by listening to them, understanding them, and also um, how that led to invariably better outcomes as well, whatever that may be, whether it be that um, the person that they were working with decided to eat that day. That, would, that in itself would be a huge achievement. So. Our, sca our staff really do show a huge amount of care and compassion towards the people that they work with. 
So I'm just going to touch on inclusive leadership as well. So Interpol, we are committed as well to, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so Interpol, we are committed to inclusive leadership. Um, we published our first gender pay gap report in December 2022. So our gender pay gap is close to zero. So this means that we have a similar proportion of men and women that work in both higher paid and lower paid roles. Um, we also introduced some flexible working, hybrid working policies. So we're embracing new ways of working, which is there to support um, you know, more family friendly policies and allowing, I suppose, more women to remain in the workforce. We are engaging directly as well with our service users, our regional for forum. So um, David and certainly our chair of the board will be involved in that and really trying to listen to the voice of the service user. Um, I'm glad to say as well, emerging leaders, that we had two of our peer advocates who had lived experience and they joined the programme for the first year last year. So they went on a three-day residential programme in, in Dundalk and for their project they created an information booklet um, to help serv service users really navigate what can be a challenging system as well. So it was great to see um, the work that's been done by the peer advocates, but also as well, Rachel, their manager who's here actually, um, and the work she did in supporting their application and I suppose their completion of the project as well. Um, okay, so um, I just want, we're talking about I suppose leadership and how we lead the way and through our workforce as well. So I just wanted to mention as well, a number of programs that we have in place to support leadership development. So we have our Building Blocks Programme, Trauma-Informed Care, Emerging Leaders, Management Essentials, and we're now um, thankfully starting to embark on a graduate programme as well. So the Building Blocks Programme, that really just ensures that new joiners in Nepal have the right skills to work in a low threshold service and um, using harm reduction techniques. Um, so this was really instrumental in helping us to integrate um, our new regional services as well and get a kind of a consistent way of working. Um, we also introduced mentoring as well. So we, we had a lot of peer support um, between the services and um, we also had some service visits. So staff went from one service to the other, just I suppose to better understand what each service did. Um, so that was really good. And the mentoring as well was was very positive as well. And those relationships are still continuing this to this day. And we're trying to um, expand that program now and um, create, um, I suppose, a, a bigger program essentially where more people are you know, willing to give their time towards mentoring others. Um, because we are a growing organization as well. So it's important when we have a lot of new staff, new managers that um, we help each other along the way. Um, so trauma-informed care, so that's really about um, understanding that our service users are more, are more likely to have adverse childhood experiences and that, um, that the staff themselves understand that, the trauma, and also understand that homelessness is a trauma in, in itself um, and that they look at themselves as well and their self-care and that they it starts with with yourself really it's about um, giving yourself the care and compassion that's needed and um, so that you can really deliver it to those that you serve as well so we promote that a lot and um, I don't always see it in action and um, it's something that we we advocate for but I did recently visit um, Spire which is one of our low threshold services and I was really impressed how the staff were committed to implementing trauma-informed care. And um, there's a lot of physical lim limitations on the building, and um, but that hasn't held them back. They're really working with the landlord to try and make changes, come up with solutions that would improve the current situation for, for service users as well. Um, so in terms of emerging leaders as well, that's been a program that's been in place long before, before I joined DePaul certainly, but um, and um, we're always kind of trying to make it better. And it's really about building confidence and um, for people to lead in the work, no matter what role they carry out. Um, 
And in the last two years, we have um, had, I suppose, 20% of, of people who um, were actually promoted then to management positions. So that, that that's a really positive statistic as well. And, um, and hopefully people are embracing it, but also then we'll, we'll stay with DePaul as well. Um, and then finally, in terms of our graduate programme, so we were very lucky to receive funding this year from the Community Foundation um, to be able to, um, I suppose, start to fast track graduates. Um, they have little or no experience, but we're really trying to help them develop to be future leaders in the community and voluntary sector. Um, so it's something that will hopefully benefit ourselves, but also could um, benefit then others in the sector as well. So um, I'll just close off by saying thank you. And um, there's been a lot achieved this year, um, and that's down to the commitment of the frontline staff, our support staff, and also our volunteers as well. So we have um, our ESC volunteers have just arrived this weekend, so they're going to be with us for, for the next year. Um, I also want to acknowledge as well the support that we get from our Board of Trustees and they give their time and expertise to DePaul, which is very valued. Um, and there are some challenges. Um, there's financial constraint, but I'm confident there is hope as well um, and that we will be able to lead the way um, in how we deliver our services. So thank you. Now, um, thank you, Sarah. I'm sorry about that little delay. We, um, we, our next speaker is Lydia Stazen, who's joining us from Chicago. Um, so, Noreen was just helping us get make sure Lydia gets uh, logged in there. And I think, uh, Lydia, you might be on mute, so just get ready to take yourself off mute once I give you your big intro. Um, I make no promises that I'll do it justice. But um, Lydia is a dedicate, has a dedicated a career to building a world where people have a place to call home and a strong foundation um, on which they can build upon that. Um, Lydia has held executive leadership roles across the Midwest um, in anti-poverty organizations, focusing on housing, employment, education, and policy and advocacy. Um, immediately prior to joining the Institute for Global Homelessness, she served as Vice Chancellor of Advancement and President uh, of the City of Colleges of Chicago Foundation um, and established a $500,000 um, fund for students' basic needs um, and emergencies and securing funding for full-time staff positions to drive college-wide responses to students served for several years. Um, yeah, so Lydia is joining us today um, and is going to speak on the United Nations. So we're going to hear we're going to hear something on a, on a more global trend, um, the progress and opportunities that we face in addressing homelessness across the country or across the world, I should say. Um, Lydia, are you with us? I'm here. Can you hear and see me? Okay. Yes, we can. You're very welcome, Lydia. We use the tagline, see it, solve it, share it, to describe what we do. Um, the first category, see it, is around our work with the United Nations to advocate for international homeless policy uh, that's focused on definition and measurement and evidence-based practices. I'll be doing a bit of a deeper dive uh, today into that uh, priority area, but I also wanted to share a little bit with you about our other two uh, priorities. Um, the second one, solve it, is 
is what we call our Vanguard program, um, where we have partnerships with um, 18 different communities around the world, including two states in Australia and now two countries uh, that have signed on formally as part of our cohort. They've set specific goals uh, to prevent, reduce, and end homelessness in their communities, and IGH connects them to research and resources and experts um, and serves as that sort of general accountability partner to help them make progress on those on those goals. Um, that work is really important to us. We don't think we could be effective advocates of the United Nations. We don't think we could effectively share our knowledge if we weren't really rooted and grounded in what is working to end homelessness in communities around the world. Uh, and then our final area of work is our knowledge sharing efforts. So um, we have done conferences and convenings and, and summits. And we uh, in 2020, we co-founded an academic journal with another university to uh, publish the latest research on what's working to end homelessness through a global lens. Um, and so that's a little bit about what IGH does. Um, I'm going to now kind of go back to that first category of see it and talk a little bit more uh, about our work with the United Nations. So if our slideshow was up and running, uh, I'd be showing you a slide that shows uh, the 17 sustainable development goals. So these are global uh, development goals that all the member states of the United Nations agreed to in 2015. Um, there are very high level goals around poverty, hunger, education, gender equality. Um, so there's 17 in total. And under these 17 are 169 different indicators that will show if the world is making progress towards these goals or not. And homelessness is not mentioned in any of the 17 goals. It's not mentioned in any of the 169 indicators. And so that's really, that's really a problem um, because as we know, what gets defined, what gets measured is what gets paid attention to. Um, the, sustainment, the sustainable development goals are, are really important for the majority of countries around the world. My country the United States, unfortunately, does not pay too much attention to the SDGs, but in our global work as IGH, we see um, countries around the world taking notice of these goals and setting their own strategies and plans towards these goals. A lot of funding is driven towards these goals. And so our work at the United Nations is really with a long-term view of trying to get homelessness included in the next set of sustainable development goals, trying to get it paid attention to um, in this current set of development goals. These goals run until 2030, so we have seven years left under this framework. Um, but the negotiations and the, and the thinking about what comes after 2030 um, are already beginning now. Um, and so we have a huge amount of work to do to continue bringing homelessness to the attention of member states and to the attention of the United Nations. Um, there's a, a sort of tagline at the United Nations about leaving no one behind. And what we see in this current framework, in this current structure, is that with no mention of homelessness, our, our neighbors, our, our global neighbors around the world who are experiencing homelessness will be left behind. And so I'm really happy to say we've made some um, pretty significant progress in the last five years. So I'll give you a little bit of a timeline um, about, um, you know, sort of how this is happening. So um, in 2017, um, the United Nations NGO Working Group to End Homelessness was founded. Um, it was founded um, actually in large part by a group of um, Catholic and Vincentian organizations um, to really begin to raise awareness of the issue of homelessness within the ecosystem of the UN, highlight its absence in the current sustainable development goal structure um, and just begin to make some noise around it. Because when we look back at how this current set of goals were negotiated, we did not see a strong um, advocacy voice for the issue of homelessness at the UN. And so this group was founded to help um, address that gap. So 2017. I guess that's six years ago now. I keep saying five, but it's six. Um, and so through the advocacy of this working group, um, 
One of the commissions at the UN, a very uh, kind of a weak commission, is called the Commission on Social Development. Um, they selected their annual theme um, to be a theme that included the issue of homelessness. Um, and so as a part of this commission, the first resolution on homelessness uh, was negotiated. I was able to attend and they call it an expert convening along with um, Baroness Louise Casey, who maybe some of you know, who has been the chair of IGH's board. Um, we, we flew down to Nairobi, Kenya and met with a, a global group of folks um, to begin to explore how homelessness connects into the sustainable development goals. And the, the results of that convening kind of turned into the draft of this resolution on homelessness, which got you know, negotiated um, all, all, different, all different ways, um, but was really important as a, a milestone document um, in sort of the history of the United Nations as a statement, a resolution on homelessness, as important to achieving the sustainable goals, the sustainable development goals, as connecting to all these different resolutions and structures um, that already exist within the United Nations. Um, and so that was passed in 2020. A couple of really important things happened in that resolution. Um, one is it did say clearly homelessness may not be included explicitly in this set of sustainable development goals, but it is important to achieving all 17 of the goals. How can you have no poverty if you still have homelessness? How can you achieve gender equity when you still have um, so many women and girls experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity? So it really stated that here. Another thing that it did is it put forward the first global definition of homelessness, um, which included three parts. One, literal street homelessness. Uh, two, people living in temporary or crisis accommodation. And three, people living in inadequate and insecure housing. So what that looks like might be different from country to country, but all countries have those top line um, manifestations of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, and then the third thing that the resolution did is it called for better uh, collection of data on homelessness and um, more transparency around um, who is experiencing this different types of, of homelessness. Um, we can't say today how many people around the world are experiencing homelessness um, because many governments do not measure, uh, many governments measure but don't communicate transparently about it. Um, and so this is the United Nations saying this needs to be measured and communicated so that we can all understand the scope of what's going on and we can begin to draw some comparisons between countries about what's working and what's not working. Um, so that was in 2020. Um, on the back of that resolution, IGH was able to sign a formal partnership with the United Nations Human Settlements Program um, and really become their sort of go-to partner on the issue of global homelessness. And so we've continued to um, advocate broadly through the United Nations, but also really specifically with that particular agency, which looks at human settlements, um, which, you know, in our mind definitely includes people who, who are living on the streets and living in temporary accommodation and living in inadequate and insecure housing. Um, and so in 2021, the General Assembly passed a twin resolution on homelessness. So we went in one year from sort of the weakest, uh, one of the weaker commissions at the United Nations to the most powerful commission, which is the General Assembly. It was basically an identical resolution. They didn't really change much of the language or much of the wording. But what they did add in was a requirement that the Secretary General report back in two years to the General Assembly on the issue of homelessness. And that was really exciting for us because it was the first accountability mechanism on homelessness um, that we've ever seen within the United Nations ecosystem. So um, that indicated that it is an issue that member states believe is worthy of continued attention. And we knew the issue was going to come back before the General Assembly. So that was in 2021. Uh, it said Secretary General, General reports back in two years, which would be 2023. Uh, and so just last week, he released his report on the issue of global homelessness. Now, it was a 12-page report, so there's not really too much you can say about the huge issue of global homelessness in 12 pages. Um, but what it did say was 
because of things like the COVID pandemic, because of growing inequality around the world. We see homelessness numbers increasing everywhere, which is true. The, the sort of latest numbers from countries that do measure are coming out um, and it's increasing everywhere except for, as you can probably uh, guess, Finland and Denmark. So um, the Scandinavian countries continue to kind of lead the way globally in terms of uh, addressing homelessness, but it's up everywhere um, other than that. And so it continues to be a pressing issue um, for member states countries to deal with. Um, the report also goes a little bit further in terms of data collection and measurement, and it sets forth specific recommendations for how countries should think about measuring, how often they should measure homelessness, and it highlights different um, vulnerabilities to homelessness. Sometimes people will say, well, any one of us are just one paycheck away from homelessness, and that's not actually true. Um, homelessness falls along the intersections of a lot of different social issues, your gender, your race and ethnicity, your um, mental or physical disability status, your um, migration or citizenship status. Um, people who, who live at these intersections are particularly vulnerable to homelessness. Um, and so the report highlights all of those different components, um, which is great to see because that's how we develop particular interventions to have particular needs of needs. And the report also calls for, you know, increasing research and communication and transparency about what's working. Um, I can't stress enough how global an issue of homelessness is. Um, we see this right now in my hometown of, of Chicago, where I stand today. We, over the past year, have received um, nearly 9,000 refugees from Central and South America, and it's overwhelmed our homeless shelter system. We have uh, more encampments popping up around the city. We have people living um, living on the floors of police stations for months on end. People are living in church basements. And so, you know, we have often thought about this as a local issue, um, but now we really can't get away from, from the understanding that it is a global issue. And as we put local solutions in place, we also be considering global context and working together to address some of those global drivers. Um, so it's been a really you know, exciting time to um, see the United Nations to take on this issue and to see it raised in importance within the UN. Um, in terms of the United Nations works, six years is a very short amount of time for these types of resolutions and uh, momentum to so it's, you know, again, in the UN context, it's moving lightning fast. We have a couple of things that we're, we're pushing towards. Um, in 2025, so in two years, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and their 169 indicators will undergo what's called a comprehensive review. Um, and so we're going to be working behind the scenes to advocate for an indicator on homelessness to be included. Um, the Secretary General's report from last week really kind of paves a path for that to happen. So we'll be pushing forward on that. Um, I also think about, you know, how do we get Ireland's voice and experience and knowledge on the issue of homelessness into these conversations? How do we make sure that Ireland is leading the way on homelessness in the UN? Um, there's a couple of a couple of things um, that I that I think about. One are the reporting mechanisms that already exist. Ireland is regularly reporting to the United Nations in the voluntary national review structure to say, here's how Ireland is doing according to the SDGs. Um, Ireland reports to the Human Rights Commission um, on human rights and how Ireland handles that within your context. So, you know, I could use your help in understanding and navigating to the people in Ireland who are responsible for those reports. Are we getting homelessness on their radar as something that should be reported on within these different reporting structures um, and demonstrating that Ireland has some things to say, some expertise on this? Um, and another is the Statistical Commission. 
Um, who is representing Ireland at the United Nations Statistical Commission? Are they aware of how homelessness data is collected and reported on in Ireland? Could that be a model for some countries to follow? Um, and finally, the United Nations Human Settlements Program has what they call a friends group. Um, of member states. Could Ireland join that friends group um, and, and could we, you know, help to support Ireland in having a voice on homelessness, on human settlements? I think all of these things are possible, um, but we also know within the context of this international advocacy, it's better if people from those countries are the ones advocating and talking to their ambassadors, to their representatives. IGH, we can be behind the scenes supporting, explaining the context, helping to develop talk points with, um, you know, with the, the country nationals, if you will. Um, but you can imagine it's so much more powerful in meeting with the um, Irish mission to the UN if that meeting is led by people who are from Ireland, not by someone who is from the United States or or from one of uh, one of the other countries that's um, involved in the working group. So I, I hope this was a, kind of an interesting discussion. I really would welcome more conversation with, um, you know, the supporters and, and advocates of and staff of DePaul Ireland on how we can begin to bring you and your knowledge and your expertise more and more into these conversations um, at the United Nations. Countries are always looking for expertise and knowledge from, from different countries that they can benchmark against. And I think, you know, Ireland obviously is struggling with a huge, um, you know, kind of housing market crisis, but so are many other countries. And so, again, if we can be connecting and collaborating and sharing different ideas, we can all you know, put all that knowledge and expertise towards kind of the same goal and hopefully solve it a little bit uh, a little bit faster, a little bit smarter, a little bit better together. We really believe that we're we're better together on these issues than we are separately. And there's so much knowledge uh, to be shared and learned from from around the world. And so I just offer myself an IGH in service of, of your work there in Ireland. And thank you so much for the wonderful work that you do. Um, so yeah, I hope that that was an a interesting presentation. That's everything that I had to share with you. Um, I don't know if the room allows for, for question and answers, but would certainly be very happy to to field A. Thanks so much, Lydia. Um, I think it's uh, really interesting to see the amount of work going in at UN to address this. And um, I think it'd be very interesting for the Paul Ireland to be involved in that. Um, we will have a bit of a panel discussion Lydia, so hopefully you can stay on and we'll bring you back on if anyone has a question for you and get it answered. Uh, I say that now without checking whether or not we can do that technologically, so Noreen will punch me in the head later uh, for saying Steve such things. Blair, I want to know. Um, interrupted by the minister. Um, so our, our next presentation will be uh, from Minister Derek O'Brien. Um, so I'm... I'm just going to let the minister speak for himself. Um, Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak at today's launch of DePaul's annual report. This event allows us to take stock of the really great work undertaken by DePaul and to hear the stories of those who either work with DePaul or who benefit directly from the services that you provide. For more than 20 years now, DePaul have been at the forefront of the fight to tackle homelessness and have been an important partner with me and my department in helping indiv individuals and households to exit homelessness. Organizations such as DePaul are keystones in our joined up approach to addressing homelessness. And that's why I really would like to thank you all for the work uh, that you are doing in this vital area. The annual report is a testament to that work and shows the important contribution that you have made uh, in helping some of our most vulnerable individuals. We're very thankful for the tireless efforts of all your volunteers, your staff and your board during what was a really challenging year. And I want to assure you that there is no shortage of will or determination to deal with the issue of homelessness. It remains the number one priority for me, for my department and for government. Resources and funding are not an obstacle to the urgent efforts required. 
Our own Housing for All plan confirms a housing-led approach in tackling homelessness for all groups. And this approach acknowledges that the most effective way to address homelessness is to provide more safe and secure homes. Record state investment of four and a half billion is being made available in 2023 to support the largest state home building program ever, including 9,100, excuse me, direct build social homes and five and a half thousand affordable homes this year. This government is focused on accelerating social housing supply under Housing for All. More than 90,000 social homes will be delivered between 2022 and 2030, and 47,600 new build social homes for the period 2022 to 2026, more than we have done in 50 years. Budget 2023 provides funding of over 215 million, an increase of 10% on last year for the delivery of homeless services. This increased funding will ensure local authorities can provide homeless prevention measures, state-funded emergency accommodation, and support households to successfully exit homelessness. A significant amount of work is underway across government and within my own department. We're working tirelessly with local authorities, partners like DePaul, the non-governmental sector, and other stakeholders to continue the progress that's already been made. A key component of that work is the National Homeless Action Committee, whose membership includes DePaul, and I want to thank Dave for his input and his attendance at all of those meetings. The overarching objective of the committee, which I chair, is to ensure that a renewed emphasis is brought to collaborating across government to implement the actions under Housing for All, along with bringing better coherence and coordination of homeless-related services in delivering policy measures and actions to address homelessness. I would like to thank you once more for the really important work that's being done by DePaul and the honour of speaking at today's launch of the annual report. I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person, but keep up the great work and I look forward to continue working with you. Gurdamina Mahagul Galer. Eventually I can stop it. Um, it's lovely to hear from the Minister. It was a pity he couldn't join us today, but for him to take time out and to send us on a message. I think it really does resonate and speak to the work that is done by the staff that are here today that the Minister is willing to do that. And just to acknowledge the efforts put in by David um, at NHAC and stuff like that really have made a difference. You know, we, we continue to try and pour our words into action, uh, all of us. So um, we're on to our last speaker. We're nearly there. Um, our last speaker is the Chair of our Board of Trustees, um, John Murphy. Um, so John's going to join us and, and finish us out here. John, here you go. Thanks very much. Um, it's great to see everybody. Very interesting morning. Uh, the highlight for me, uh, with all due respect to the other speakers, was Katrina, an amazing, inspiring person, a remarkable journey. She said a couple of things that really made me think, I don't often do that, um, which was, first of all, that she needed, once she realized that she needed help and that uh, she couldn't continue her life the way she was living it, and she had to reach out she knocked on a lot of doors, including on Trinity College. And the interesting thing was that help did become available through a number of different sources. And she mentioned, uh, in addition to Trinity College, she mentioned um, community worker, the Larkin Centre for the Unemployed, etc., and various other places in the inner city. And the, thing, the interesting thing about that is to actually, the government and indeed local authorities, the HSE, other organizations, have put a lot of public money into measures to address poverty, deprivation, etc. But we're not very good at joining the dots. And part of Katrina's success was mentally, she was able to join the dots in her own head, and she was articulate enough, articulate enough very hard word to articulate, um, to, to go and make demands. And the system sort of said, oh, you need this and you need that, and you don't need to lose your rent allowance. Oh, we need to fix that. So 
at a policy-making level, because that's my background, we're not very good at saying, it's a great idea to do X, but if you do X, what about Y? We're not good at that. Uh, the minister mentioned the National Homeless Action Committee, and David has been a tireless campaigner on that, while some other people who could have said more kind of stood back because they were afraid of upsetting the minister. Uh, he's a man I know who's actually not easily upset. He is uh, he's quite tough, which you need to be as Minister for Housing. Um, the predecessor to that committee was a committee I chaired, which was to bring people at official level together from a whole range of departments and agencies to try and improve the joining up. And I wasn't very effective. I had no authority as a retired civil servant, just a moral authority. It doesn't really count for a lot. And I recommended that this isn't working. Actually, the Minister for Housing should take this problem with a scruff of the neck. So he's decided to do that. His political advisors might say, that's very unwise, Minister. Are you sure that's a good idea? He's decided to do that. And he has the chief executives of the key NGOs in the room, but not necessarily the various civil servants or public servants who need to go back to their organizations and say, we need to think about this, we need to change that. So it's not that we're not, the other tragedy that really struck me listening to our various speakers today, including Sarah, yeah, and was that it's not that we're not spending money addressing these problems. We're just not doing it very effectively. And as an NGO, we find ourselves struggling to make ends meet while the minister is talking about investing four and a half billion in housing. You know, we have people who've uh, been evicted effectively or uh, priced out of the rental sector, families and individuals who end up looking for homeless accommodation, emergency accommodation. Well, at the same time, the state is pouring a lot of money into rent allowance payments, which get swallowed up in a dysfunctional private rental sector. We put a lot of pressure on the building and developing and construction industry to deliver more homes, but too many of them are for rent only because the only finance the developers could get was not from the banks who were reluctant to lend after the crash. They got their fingers and more than their fingers burnt uh, lending to property, but pension funds. Pension funds want a long-term asset that delivers a big return. So build to rent became the solution. So the government has had to step in and say, no, we don't want that anymore. We want more cost rental or other things. But we're only stepping in after the problem has happened. And trying to, uh, trying to change the housing system is like, trying to turn an ocean liner very quickly. Uh, it's, it's slow to move. And that's why our experience and our ability as an organization to advocate with credibility based on that experience is so important. But equally, it's our ability to be flexible and to see a problem, and as Lydia said, see it, solve it, share it. So because we are on the ground dealing with a whole range of people with different complex needs, we see it, first of all. We are quick to think outside the box. How can we address this? How can we solve this? So some of the work that David mentioned about working with people in direct provision or people who, uh, because of refugee crisis around the world, have come to Ireland that's about, we can make a difference. Instead of sitting here wringing our hands saying, isn't it terrible all these people are coming here and we have nothing for them. We're out there doing it. But then we have to share it so that we can be effective in people generally uh, and the general public understanding the issues and then government doing more or doing more effective things more effectively to address it. And finally, Lydia's uh, focus on the international scene is very important um, because as I, in the past, had the opportunity to represent Ireland uh, explaining how we were dealing with 
various aspects of human rights. She's absolutely right. What gets measured is what gets done. And the UN taking an interest is very important in the longer term. Uh, the fact that we have increasing refugee crisis around the world uh, is linked to failures in climate change. It's linked to the global security situation. The war in Ukraine being the most recent immediate example that resonates with us uh, and our colleagues in Nepal, Ukraine. So the UN needs to take an interest in homelessness as a result of all the other and as a, you know, a component of all the other issues that it considers to be important. And if it does that, and governments, including the Irish government, actually have to sit up and take notice. That is to the good. But it isn't just about agonizing over it or producing reports or feeling good about bashing the government at some committee in the United Nations. It's about thinking about what works, how does it work, how do we get funding for it, and how do we continue to make a difference. Um, you know, there's a lot of numbers in the impact report, but behind each of those numbers are, is a person or a family or a household. So the people that we have individually helped and their families, that's extremely important. But of course, the other side of the coin is that people who fall through the gaps in the overall uh, uh, social system and to experience homelessness, it's not just those individuals that are affected, it's their wider family. And therefore, the problem isn't just, are there more homeless this month than there was last month? It's about the full impact of that. And as Sarah pointed out, the pressure that that places on us as an organization and on our staff to continue to respond to that. Uh, yesterday, we had the opportunity to listen to Father Vitali from Ukraine talk about how to Paul Ukraine is responding to the horrific situation there. And he said a very interesting thing that I hadn't really thought about before, which was sometimes when there's a real crisis, you try and do too much too quickly and you, you know, you can burn out. So the challenge for the leadership of DePaul and the staff in DePaul is how do we, how do we respond in a way that we'll still be able to respond next week and the week after and the week after that? And as a board and with the senior leadership led by David, we have to think about what do we have to put in place that facilitate the development of DePaul and its ability to respond? Can we, can we attract and retain and develop the right staff? Do we have the right relationships with our funders? Are we doing an effective job communicating? Are we fundraising well? Are we making good use of our relationships with other stakeholders, other organizations in the sector, uh, corporate partners, etc., so that we can continue to make a difference into the future? That's a big challenge, which I think Sarah encapsulated very well. So, David, finally, thank you uh, for your leadership over the last uh, 12 months and over uh, the period before that. Uh, 2023 is just as challenging a year. I have no doubt so will 2024 be. So hopefully we can uh, keep smiling and uh, keep thinking back to our vision, mission and values that, as Sarah said, is like our North Star will sustain us into the future. So thanks very much. <laughs>
Do you want me to take the mic um, for the guys? Um, no, we're good. Any questions from the audience? Okay, Ross. I'll just start uh, Dermot with an, an easy enough one, hopefully. Um, David, I suppose with Budget 2024 being talked about, for the poll, what is um, the number one ask as an organization that would right. I suppose, impact all of us next year? <clears throat> Our number one ask is parity of salary. Um, with the public service. That's our number one ask. We absolutely recognise that as an organisation, John just touched on it there, if, there, if we are going to be sustainable in the longer term and if we are to be able to respond on an ongoing basis, this issue has to be addressed. And we are like a Rottweiler in regards to addressing this specific issue. And that doesn't, it's no consolation to kind of individuals in their pockets at the moment. We recognize that. Sarah's talked about the retention and recruitment crisis um, that we faced and you, your, the staff within the, the, the room and online now at, at kind of face value uh, from the cold face, what that means in terms of how you've had to struggle and use challenges. So um, I was on radio this morning and Pat Kenny said to me around, you know, um, it must take an awful lot of kind of dedication and vocation. No, it doesn't. It takes professional staff and professional staff who are trained. Um, and why it was so important for Sarah to present today was to give a really kind of key insight into we are committed to your staff and we are committed to developing you uh, as much as we can. But if we are to respond to, to the, some of the most critical issues that I really think is affecting social cohesion, um, like the homeless crisis, like the drug crisis, like the crisis within the north and in, inner city, northeast inner city, like the asylum system, we need to be able to respond from organisations. We've been at the forefront of that. You've been at the forefront of that. It may not feel like that at times, but in order for us to be able to continue to that, our number one priority is supporting the process within the WRC for, for pay parity to exist um, and for us to get the funding from Budget 24 in order for us to be able to uplift our service level agreements so we can pay people uh, at the levels that they deserve. Thank you, Danny. Any other questions? Sure. I find the uh, discussion from America very interesting, but I think it was focused largely on relationships with the United Nations. What are we doing in terms of uh, promoting homelessness as a major European issue uh, through FIANSA and organizations like that? Um, I think um, what we're trying to do through DePaul International is create a coalition ourselves. Um, I think we're getting stronger as um, a coalition of countries. Um, we have uh, obviously links with the UK, Croatia, Slovakia uh, and Ukraine. Um, I think what we're looking to do and um, our ambition will be to have a, a more strong and cohesive voice, and I think Lydia can speak about that. Um, because you know, Lydia knows my thoughts on this, you know, the United Nations may feel quite distant at times. And one of the kind of reasons why we 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 talked and brought Lydia on today is to make that get that connectivity going even stronger and make people feel that there's a, a relationship between the work that you do on the ground and what is happening within the developing world and beyond. So I think the, the, the vehicle for us, so at the moment, Stephen's not in the room, Caroline's in the room, we're looking at maybe the possibility of a transnational um, 
application to the EU um, that would go across uh, the, the countries within the Polar International. So I don't know, Lydia, do you want to step in there in terms of the vision, in terms of us working closer together um, as, a, as an international group? Yes, so the European Union platform on homelessness came in June of 2020. So really similarly timed to the energy happening on homelessness at the UN. And so IGH has a good relationship with Fianza. They're really leading the way on that. And so we're just trying to make sure that those efforts are aligned and supporting each other. You don't want to have the UN coming out and saying, this is how countries should measure and then have the EU platform say something different. So we're making sure that all of those things are aligned. I think having Ireland's voice and perspective more strongly in those efforts um, there in the EU would be extremely welcome. Um, and yeah, Fianza is, is the primary sort of partner on that. Um, and then in terms of, you know, kind of the international cooperation of the different DePaul subsidiaries, I think, again, that only strengthens the work globally because then there are sort of more examples to point to. Um, and I know the new... Uh, a deputy executive director for the United Nations Human Settlements Program is actually from Slovakia. So we have these wonderful relationships and partnerships within the DePaul group that I think we could tap into more and more. Um, it's just a matter of having the network solid. Hopefully that answers your question to some degree. Um, any other questions people would like to ask? Susan um, I was struck by the, the um, it's a comment but a question, the comparison between vocation and professionalism. And I was struck by my exposure to the providers in the court, who have a very high degree of vocation, and that is very, very good to know. But it's also very good to know that there is a desire towards um, parity, because that will be understand that we're just trying to go and get to life. Must be continually um, prompted so that we can continue continue to keep finance sure that it's all in the professional and um, thing. But yeah. I'm just wondering about when the budget is 24, 25, 26, and when the decline, as history shows us, the money goes eventually on that, could the vocation and very big opportunity for development of professionals, and I've seen that myself in my own jobs in the last. And um, encouraged by the fact that you have this, um, it's called the vocation, the ethos program going on, where you would sponsor people to progress and to, to get the, to the, the root of why we were in this job at all. Mm. I'm just wondering how much your know, finances go into that, the other social drive, and from yourselves to make it happen. I wouldn't want to say you're talking about a professional kind of. You know the support we're trying to come from a practical point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of um, we fund, I suppose through a number of ways. Um, we don't. Um, I suppose we get our statutory funding. Some of it goes towards training, but we have greater costs than that to be able to run the amount of um, training that we have. So we we have applied for grants over the years, and we've been very successful with that. So we have applied. Um, for grants, I know the Northern Ireland Housing Executive gave us a, a large grant um, during the pandemic as well to create a lot of online learning, so blended learning. So we're quite geographically dispersed. So we 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 try to do a blended approach to learning, um, and that is about keep maintaining professional development um, where people can log on at any time, anywhere, and then also attend a classroom as well. So get the get the knowledge online. Get a certain amount and then do the practical skills piece then either in person or through through a classroom so there's kind of um i suppose a number of ways and we we are always looking at what are the gaps as well in terms of knowledge and skills so we, we've started that um at the moment we're in the middle of surveying all our staff um <laughs> please answer the <laughs> the link <laughs> so yeah we've been sending around links at asking for feedback around um getting a view on is there anything that we need to address and um you know when we're looking at budgets and stuff like that how to manage 
the finances. So our statutory partners definitely give us funding towards the mandatory training. And then we were quite innovative in, in what we then uh, look for and, and what we need to fund. And so we have a good collaboration with the fundraising and communications department as well, um, who have um, worked closely with me to apply for, for grants. Um, and then we also, um, our, our graduate program now is going to be supported through a grant as well. So we have um, the community foundations are going to, um, I suppose, fund 50% of that. And then we have potential then with another grant provider as well to get the rest of the 50% funded as well. But addressing that issue to, about yeah. how do we, if we, if we were to get an uplift, how do you keep it going? We support sip position around getting a, a, a seat around the public service awards negotiations as an NGO sector. And I think that's the way in order for us to be able to try to benchmark going forward. So when there's a public service award that the NGO sector are not left behind. Um, and I think that's probably the way in which we get to that place. Um, we support SIP2 in that, that attempt. And I'm personally advocating for, for that piece as well. Um, guys, we're coming to the very end, but I do have one question. It's for John. Um, I'd like to put him on the spot. <laughs> uh, you can sit down. You don't have to come up if you don't want to. Um, I guess my question for you is, we're all we've talked about. We've talked about all the challenges the Paul faced, the staff faced, the work that David's doing, what the minister said. What are the challenges for the trustees to ensure that the organisation runs well? What's, what's the things that keep you guys up at night? Well, um... I have to say, generally speaking, I sleep soundly at night. <laughs> um, um, but, but, but more seriously, um, good governance is critical to all organisations, especially where you're running a whole range of services, doing new things uh, under pressure, sometimes on the funding front. And... Um, Organizations trying to respond to complex social issues will take some risks to try and be effective to address the problem. But the flip side of that is, if you look at it through the prism of the, the board and its responsibilities is, hold on a minute now, you know, is this the right risk to be taking? Is it sustainable? Can we afford it? What about next year, etc.? So. We try to make sure as a board that yes, we're supportive, but also that we're challenging. Not just about the day-to-day -day operations, but that we're forward-looking as well, looking out over the next three to five years. And that's why things like having a graduate program, you know, having good focus on leadership program, having a good focus on compliance is particularly important. And it's only when an organization gets into difficulty and it's in the papers or on the, in the media generally that people start asking, but where was the board? And did they not see this? Did they not know that? And usually, in fairness to NGOs, including ones that have got into difficulty, everybody was operating with the best of intentions. And maybe they took some risks that possibly they shouldn't have taken or things didn't work out the way they thought they would work out, and suddenly they're in trouble. Um, you know, that's that's probably the, th the thing that's most important to us. It's to be supportive, to be, you know, trying to future-proof the organization, but keep an eye on the old figures as well. You know? Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. <laughs> Joyce. And that brings us to the end of our annual report launch. I want to thank everybody who's joined us both in the room, but also those that have joined us online. Thank the minister for his video for us today. And just really just congratulate everybody who's been involved in setting up today. The fundraising and communication team have done an awesome job, in particular now to Noreen and Caroline who've worked on it. And great. Um,